pray. Father God, we've sung our praise to you. We've lifted you up. <coughs> and Father, as I speak today, may you continue to be lifted up. May each one of us here today look to you and to what you have to say to us today. Amen. So, today we continue our series, Growing on the Front Line. And as we've passed the first uh, halfway point, as we've passed the halfway point, I thought it would be good to just do a little recap of where we've got to so far. Last week, or the week before now, a week ago, we gathered here in church, those of us who are in house groups, and we reviewed how we've been getting on. But I realised that not everybody was able to be at that session, and some of you have missed some of the sessions that we've been looking at. So we're going to just have a, a, re a recap over that. So at the beginning, we tried to identify and began to identify our own front lines and to recognise that these are the places where we spend time during the week interacting with others, whether that be in a workplace environment or in our leisure activities or in a shop or on the street or on a bus or wherever it is that you meet with people, that we meet with people. First of all, in our first session, we thought about growing wherever we are and how we need to grow in those places to bear fruit for the kingdom. And we considered that God sometimes grows us in unexpected ways. And through considering a Bible passage about how Abigail was able to appease David's anger and his desire for revenge, we were able to reflect on how God can use the situations that we face as opportunities for us to grow and become more fruitful. And then in session two, we reflected on how our choices can affect our fruitfulness. We thought about the choices that Adam and Eve made to serve themselves rather than to obey God and how the choices that we make can either help or hinder our growth. And then we considered the story of the Good Samaritan, and we were able to recognise how our choices, how our desires can drive us to make the choices that we do. Desires for approval, for security, and for control. And we were encouraged to identify whether our desires are anchored in God or in other sources. And to think about whether God himself is the desire of our heart. And to acknowledge that it is only with his help that we can grow closer to him and be more fruitful in our lives. And then our last session in those first four focused on the temptations of Jesus. We thought about how Satan tried to use the underlying emotions to tempt Jesus to follow a different path from the one that God had planned for him. And we reflected how our own emotions can be indicators of the unchecked desires that are sometimes hidden beneath the surface. And today, we move into a new section where we turn from looking at our inward selves and focus more on the ways that God is at work in us to transform us into his likeness. Romans 12 verse 2, do not conform yourselves to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It goes on, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Now, I love this verse and for many years I had it posted on the wall at home. And that's why it is now my daughter's favourite verse too. 
do not conform, but be transformed. This speaks of a dual enterprise. There is something for us to do, and there is something for God to work in us as well. We are not to conform, but it is God who transforms us as we look to him and learn from him. For those of you who have already covered this session, you will have looked at a number of passages of scripture which show how the Apostle Peter grew and matured in faith, in character, and in his knowledge of the purposes of God. But today, we're going to look at one of the letters that he wrote and how he encourages us to grow to maturity in our faith also. Peter wrote this letter to those who have received a precious faith like ours. So that's all believers everywhere. Everyone who has been born again into a new life with Christ. If that's you, then this is Peter's letter to you. It's his letter to us, to this church in Great Shelford. And it's something that Peter wants us to remember, even though they are things that we should already know, because sometimes we need to be reminded of important things, truths that we should have embedded and rooted in the bedrock of our faith. And David is going to come and read the passage to us. Thank you. I am going to read, but if you want to follow along, then um, do put your hand up and I'm sure somebody will bring you a Bible if you haven't uh, got one. Uh, we're using the Church Bibles and now on page uh, 1222, right, almost at the end of the Bible, 1222, uh, to Peter and the first 12 verses. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through those he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge to knowledge, self-control, self, uh, to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is short-sighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail, never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. Thank you, David. 
Now, here's a question for you. What do these three things have in common with each other and with this conquer? So, we've got a hobby craft pack, which is make a light up bag. We've got the logo for IKEA. I have to say that properly. And we have a box of items from HelloFresh. Has anybody got any ideas what the connection might be? Okay, I will tell you. The craft bag has everything inside the pack to make the bag, the light up bag. Ikea is famous for flat pack furniture. And everything you need to assemble the furniture should be included in the box. HelloFresh delivers ingredients to make meals and all the ingredients required to make up the recipes are supplied in the box. What about the conker? Within this conker has been put all that is required for growth. Given the right conditions, this seed will grow into a horse chestnut tree. And Peter tells us in the passage that we've just read that by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. A life in which we grow in our knowledge of God and in our obedience to him. And note that this is the same power that raised Christ from death. Ephesians tells us it is the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So God has given us everything we need. But just as if you receive a craft pack or a package of flat pack furniture or a box of recipe ingredients, Unless you make the effort to do something with them, that is all they will ever be. In the same way, this conquer will not grow into a tree unless it is planted and watered. Only then will it grow. And the seed will produce a shoot which will grow into a sapling and then it will become a mature tree bearing fruit. And... As with all plants, this tree will always grow towards the light, and so must we. We have been given all that we need for growth. What is it that we have been given? Peter opens his letter with a blessing of grace and peace, telling us that these are given in abundance through our knowledge of God and of Jesus. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is when God lavishes on us his favour, a favour that is not earned. God's undeserved love for the unlovable and his unmerited goodness. Grace is given to us but we need to take a step of faith to utilise the gifts that we have been given. And together, grace and faith are the things needed to become part of the kingdom of God, God's grace and our faith. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But we don't get given just a measured amount. We get grace in abundance. God's grace continues to grow and we are to grow in it. We are to grow spiritually mature in grace and in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we grow and mature in our knowledge of him, 
so too will our experience of his grace and peace. These blessings which encourage and strengthen us on our Christian walk. And it's a picture of what God wants for us. Not from us, but for us. His desire for us is that we should grow ever closer to him and ever more like him. To share his divine nature. And how mind-blowing is that? His desire for us is that we should grow deeper in him so that from that fullness we can allow him to flow out to others. And that's maturity, that's fruitfulness. Now, while I've been speaking, has anyone seen Clive move on the chair? No. I'm very sorry to disillusion you here, but you won't see him move because Clive is not alive. <laughs> he's a puppet. And as he sits over there, he's just an empty shell. He only comes to life when I fill him and he's attached to me. In the same way, we are born again into a new life when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who gives us new life. It's the Spirit who empowers us. The Spirit who works in us and through us to bring us to maturity in Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. It's Ephesians 4. God has given us the starter pack, but we need to use what we have been given so that we grow and mature in faith and fruitfulness. Through God's grace and our faith and the work of the Holy Spirit, we can develop what we have as we keep growing towards the light. So in the passage, Peter lists some of the ways that we need to develop. Areas where we need to work in order to become spiritually mature. We start with faith, but we need to add goodness, then knowledge, then self-control, then perseverance, then godliness, mutual love, brotherly affection and love. These are all attributes of Jesus. We can't produce them ourselves, but as we choose to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit within us, we become increasingly like him, starting with his goodness. And we grow in knowledge as we learn and apply God's truth from the word. Self-control develops when we recognise and master our emotions rather than allowing them to control us. And sometimes we may get it wrong or feel that we have failed. But we persevere and we keep on working and keep on growing and not give up. And the word for godliness in this passage is one that is used to refer to those who keep in close contact with God. It's one of the things that we have been encouraged to do through the use of the exam and prayer. Thinking about the times in our day when we have felt God close to us and striving to repeat those and acknowledge them and grow them. And then we have brotherly affection and love. 
God's love, which originates in the one who loves us. God loves because he is love. And we love because we are from God. We aim to achieve a love for one another and a greater love for him who loves us. But without God's love, we can't do that. And these are ways in which we work out our salvation. When we look at that list, it might seem as if it's an impossible task. But when we do it in the strength of Jesus and keep our eyes fixed on him, on whom our faith depends, when we rely on him to help us in our task, then we will keep growing these qualities in increasing measure, as it says in the passage, and we will be effective and productive in bearing fruit. Growing in grace is about taking advantage of what God has already done for us. Our faith shapes what we are, what we know and think, what we do, and how we do it. However, just like trees, we are subject to seasons as we mature in faith and fruitfulness. There are seasons of rapid growth, seasons of fruitfulness and harvest, and also seasons of rest and renewal. And we face a cycle of seasons throughout our lives. Sometimes, as was commented on in my house group, we experience all the seasons in a single day. But we continue to grow through these times. And that is maturity. And that is fruitfulness. Peter says that we need to remember these things. In other words, don't forget. Don't leave your furniture half finished. Don't let your ingredients go rotten in the box. Don't leave your conquer on the windowsill to shrivel up. Use what you have been given. Take full advantage of the resources that God has given you. Never lose heart and continue to grow towards the light. Let's just pray. Father God, thank you for all that you have given us. Thank you most of all that you have given us yourself. And that it is through your son Jesus that we can come to you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us and renew us and encourage us and inspire us. That we might continually grow more like you. That we might be mature in faith and that we might be fruitful for you in all the places you send us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sarah. Please.